As a last example of some basic quantum mechanics calculations to do, I want to talk briefly about time evolution, how states change with time. In particular, I'm going to be talking about a spin system, as we have been, spin one half particles, electrons, in a magnetic field. I'm going to orient the magnetic field at some angle theta with respect to the z-axis, from z toward angle theta down toward plus x. And so what that will mean, if you work through the uh, magnetic uh, energy of this system, is that the two energy eigenstates of this system are going to be the aligned and anti-aligned states. The plus theta and the minus theta states will be the energy eigenstates. And uh, we'll set up the direction of the magnetic field such that the energy of our plus theta state is plus E for some value of E, and the energy of our minus theta state will be zero. We're just choosing our zero point of energy to be there. Remember, you get to choose what your energy equals zero is no matter what. That, that's always handy. So uh, we've got those as our energy eigenstates. We're going to have our initial state of the system be simply the plus Z state. Uh, so it's going to be at an angle with, with respect to these energy eigenstates. And the question we're going to want to ask is, how does the probability of measuring such an electron in the plus Z state change over time? We're going to hope that at time equals zero, it comes out to be 100%, because that's how we set it up. But at later times, what's the probability of measuring our electron in the plus Z state? That's the plan. So things we're going to need to remember to do this, the plus theta state in our conventions is written as the cosine of theta over 2 and the sine of theta over 2 is the two components of its uh, z, uh, spin z basis uh, vector representation. And the minus theta state is written as minus sine of theta over 2 and cosine theta over 2 is its two components. We're going to be even more specific just for definiteness for this example. We're going to choose theta to be 73.74 degrees most of the way down toward the x-axis. And that means, in particular, that the cosine and sine of theta over 2 are these convenient numbers, four-fifths and three-fifths, that we can use to make our lives a little bit easier as we do these calculations. So, okay, we want to do this time evolution calculation. We want to know how time evolution is going to work in this system, how the state's going to change with time, and the first step in that has to be to understand the initial state of the system in terms of the, uh, in terms of the energy states. So, here's the story. What we want to do we want is that we want to write psi of time equals zero, that state as some, uh, as some linear combination, a, a sum of these two states. So I'll call it a constant plus times the plus theta state plus some constant minus times the minus theta state. That's, my, that's my, what I have set up. That, that's the equation we're going to need to use. And we need to somehow write this state as a linear combination of those two. Let me write that out in terms of our vector representation to be clear about that. My plus z state is just directly, that's the state 1, 0, because that's the basis that we've chosen to represent all of our spin vectors in in, this, in these examples. And so that's going to be equal to this coefficient times, well, my plus theta state I've represented down here, uh, c plus times 4 fifths three-fifths plus C minus times minus three-fifths four-fifths. So this is a system of two equations and two unknowns. You can solve for C plus and C, and C minus. That'll be perfectly reasonable to do. You could even do it for arbitrary cosines and sines, for arbitrary theta. Uh, the easier way to do it is this. It turns out that C plus is equal to the plus theta state bra with the psi of zero ket. That bracket is our C plus. And so what is that? That is, um, this is this. I need to take the conjugate transpose. So four fifths, three fifths times one zero. That's easy enough. Four fifths. And by the same token, it's going to be that C minus can be found as the minus theta with psi of zero. Uh, and again, same token, that's kind of going to come out to be three-fifths. Um, okay, hang on, no, minus three-fifths is what it's going to come out to be because of the, that's what we're going to come up with when I do this step. So, okay, this is what I get when I skip steps. All right, so I've got the coefficients now. So that means that I know what psi of t equals zero is. So the time evolution rule is actually really simple. 
technically, it's really simple technically. The statement is then that, maybe I'll put this in a fancy different color. Uh, the statement is that my state as a function of time, psi of t, is equal to, I'll write it out symbolically first, uh, c1 times e to the minus i, well, uh, c plus e to the minus i e plus t over h bar times, uh, I guess in my case, the plus theta state plus c minus e to the minus i e minus t over h bar times the minus theta state. Those are my energy eigenstates. All I'm doing is taking this expression up here and inserting into each one of these terms, just inserting an extra factor of an exponential phase. It's just a phase factor e to the i times a real number that changes with time. So when I do that, I guess I know my e plus is just e, my e minus is zero, and e to the zero is one, so that's when that term's gonna come out to be simple. And when I do this, I can write it out. C plus was, this is four-fifths e to the minus i e t over h bar times the plus theta state. And then here, minus three-fifths times the minus theta state. That's what I have. And I can do this, I can write this down in terms of the column vector, in, in terms of our rep vector representation. Remember that the plus theta was this thing, the minus theta was this thing. So uh, multiplying out what I get from this, I can say that psi of t will be equal to what do I have? I've got uh, a great big column vector uh, here, four-fifths e to the i things times this, that is 16 twenty-fifths e to the minus i e t over h bar. Uh, that's the four-fifths times four-fifths times this. Uh, for my lower component, I'm going to have four-fifths times three-fifths, so 12 twenty-fifths e to the minus i e t over h bar. That's my first piece. And then minus three-fifths times this, I'm going to distribute that in, plus looks like just nine twenty-fifths. And minus three times four is minus twelve twenty-fifths. Those are my vector components, my, my q vector components, my, my quantum state vector components, as, uh, as Tom Moore puts it. So I, can, I just add this up, I guess. I can factor out a 1 25th just to make this look simpler. 1 25th times the vector. Factor this out, I've got 9 plus 16 e to the minus i e t over h bar. And down here, I've got minus 12 plus 12 times e to the minus i e t over h bar. So I've got a psi of t that's shown up here. And I should probably check that this is reasonable. Anytime I've done a bunch of calculations, I always want to check that it's reasonable. So in particular, I look at this, I plug in time equals zero. At t equals zero, I had better have e to the zero equals one. And so my top component is nine plus 16, which is 25 over 25 is one. My bottom component is minus 12 plus 12, that's zero. So at least it works for time equals zero. That's enough of a double check for me for right now. I've, it, that means I've avoided at least the most common errors, the most, the most likely errors. So okay, this is my, my state as a function of time. And having gotten to this point, I can now ask what's the probability of measuring, it, of measuring this state to be in the plus z state? All right, to do that, to do that I'm going to sacrifice this little bit of math that stuck out that was going to be boring anyway. Um, just sacrifice it. Uh, I'll put this in here minus theta, just to have it over there. All right, but now, what do I do with this? To measure something, to ask a question in quantum mechanics, we start by finding an amplitude. And so in particular, I'm going to find what is the amplitude for plus z with psi of t. What's that amplitude look like? Well, that is just the product of my plus z bra, one to zero, times this, uh, boy, this ugly thing, 9 plus 16 e to the minus i 
et over h bar. You can't read that. I'm just referring back down to this thing that hopefully you could read down below. And then my minus 12 plus 12 e to the minus blah. The second term is not going to matter because, hey, plus z is a pretty simple state to work with. I multiply this together. The second term goes away because it's 0 times that. The first term is what matters. This is equal to just that top 9 plus 16 e to the minus i e t over h bar. That's my first term. Uh, that, that, that's my amplitude for this. The amplitude alone is not enough yet, which is good because it's got this imaginary bit in it, and probabilities should not be imaginary. And so the probability then, for the probability of something, of a measurement, we just look at the quantum amplitude squared, the absolute square. So the probability then is plus a z psi of t absolute squared. And because this has an e to the i stuff in it, the easiest way of, of calculating the absolute square of that is going to be multiplying this quantity, the amplitude, times its complex conjugate. So it looks to me like I've squeezed this over on the side enough that I want to go down to the next row. Uh, this is going to be equal to this number, 9 plus 16 e to the minus i e t over h bar, times its own complex conjugate. What is it? That's 9 plus 16 e to the plus i e t over h bar. And I've got that. That's my product that I want to work with. And boy, I realized just at this moment that I forgot that this whole thing had to be over 25 because I had factored out a 1 over 25. Maybe that was a dangerous thing to do, factoring out the 1 over 25. So this whole thing, this was over 25, and this was over 25. <laughs> got it right. <laughs> Always do these double checks, right? You have to make sure your things, that double check in my head, by the way, was checking to make sure that my probability wasn't going to be greater than 1, which it was. So, okay, doing this, I've got a 1 over 25 squared, so I will factor out the 1 over 625 that comes from that. And then up here, I'm just going to multiply the four terms. So 9 times 9 is 81. 9 times 16, 160, 144, so plus 144 e to the i e t over h bar plus 144 e to the minus i e t over h bar. And then there was this term, and then finally the last ones, 16 squared is 256 plus 256 and those two exponentials are inverses of each other. You add the exponents and you get zero. So that's just the number 256. This is looking better. A lot of my eyes have gone away. Uh, so where does this leave me? 256 plus 81 is going to be 337. So 1 over 625 times 337 plus 100. 44 times, okay, this is where it gets tricky. E to the i e t over h bar, I can write as cosine and sine, right? That's the standard sort of thing. Uh, times, again, I've left myself way too little room over here. Uh, let me put this on the next line just to have it. Uh, plus 144 times, this one is cosine of e t over h bar plus i sine of e t over h bar. And then I'm going to add to that this other term, which is e to the minus i e t over h bar. That is plus cosine of minus e t over h bar plus i times the sine of minus e t over h bar. All right, this is where we can finally do some nice little simplifications, because at this point, Cosine of minus theta is just the same as cosine of theta because it's an even function. So this is the same as just being positive there. Sine of minus theta is the same as minus sine of theta because it's an odd function. It's anti-symmetric. So if I make this positive, then I can make this negative. And the beauty of that is, hey, I have a plus i sine and a minus i sine of the same argument. Those now cancel out. And so I have two cosines here. So I guess what I get overall is that my probability of measuring plus z as a function of time is going to be uh, 
337 plus 2 cosine set plus 288 cosine of ET over H bar all over 625. That's kind of a weird ratio to show up with, I suppose. But if I add them together, 337 plus 288 is going to be 500, 625. So at time equals 0, cosine is 1, and I just get that. This ranges from, at t equals 0, this equals 625 over 625, which equals 1, exactly what we wanted. At t, uh, what do I want to say? t equals, uh, the minimum value I could possibly have would be when this is exactly the opposite. So my t is pi h bar over e. That's exactly half a period later. Uh, when t equals pi h bar over e, I'll have the difference of the two, uh, which is going to be, let's see, that'll be 12, uh, just 49, really, just 49 over 625. And so that, that's my probability, that's the lowest my probability will ever get. And that kind of makes some sense. If my angle theta was actually 73 degrees, so something like this over here, and I'm precessing about this. I happen to know that precession is how this is going to behave. It's going to precess around that axis. So then this thing is going to somehow go, you know, go all the way down. I don't know quite how to draw it, but all the way down to here, somewhere closer to minus z than the plus z. So it makes sense that we're going to get a probability that can be pretty low uh, of measuring plus z when we're all the way down there. But we're never going to process all the way to the pure minus z state. There will always be some chance of measuring plus z. So that's, that's how we do these calculations. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff we could do. Uh, if you want to play along at home and try some of these things, you can check, for example, that the total probability adds up to 1. You can do the same calculation for calculating the probability of measuring minus z. And you should come up with something that adds up to 1 at all times. Should just be you know minus 288 cosine and some other factor in front to add up to. I guess it, yeah, well, you you'll, you can work out what that would come out to be. I guess they'd be the same because it's the minus 12 and 12. So you'll have that. Um, so that's the that's something you could try. Another thing you could try if you want to try this at home is figuring out the probability of measuring the plus x state. You could say what is that probability? Just in case you want to look at it, I did that calculation. Um, of measuring plus x, uh, the, the probability of measuring that, uh, when I did that calculation, I got that that probability was equal to um, 0 0.6344 minus 0 0.1344 times the cosine, the same cosine we've seen, of ET over h bar. So if you want to try one at home and see if you get the same answer, try it with the plus x state. You'll get that, uh, you'll, you'll get that relationship, and uh, hopefully, you'll, hopefully that's what you'll find, and you can double check that you're do doing these things the same way that I would be. So that's, uh, that's an example of time evolution. I know it gets a little messy. The, the math on this gets a little messy, but let me focus on what the key ideas of it are. First, you want to state what your initial state is, you want to understand what the energy eigenvectors are, the energy eigenstates of your system. Your first step then is just to write that plus z state, that initial state, in terms of some combination of the plus theta and minus theta states. Find those coefficients in whatever way you can find them. Find those coefficients, then just add in those e to the minus i e t over h bar terms. Add those in, and that's going to get you to your final uh, to, to, the, to the state you need. And after that, it's just a matter of a bunch of simplifying and a bunch of complex algebra. But it's not conceptually that bad. It's all just setting up that initial, the right phase factors for each one of these pieces and then combining it together in a reasonable way to look, to look as simple as possible. That's time evolution, and it's really remarkable that just changing the phase factors on the two things, changing the phase factors differently, is enough 
to lead to interesting behaviors. Even in the simple system, you get precession around an axis uh, very elegantly out of this just by having different phase factors on the two terms. It's pretty slick that it works that way, and it's kind of neat that in more qu complicated quantum systems, that's how phase factors work to produce all of the time evolution that we see. So I'll leave you with that.